Last week, we discovered that the church in Corinth is in deep trouble. The believer who has been functioning as their pastor has thrown up his hands and quit. Oh, poor Apollos. He returned to Ephesus where he's given Paul the bad news about what's happening in the Corinthian church. Aquila and Priscilla apparently, now this is just me filling in the gaps, but I think they returned to Ephesus some time ago, probably shortly after they introduced Apollos to the Corinthians. I think they, I think they were, they had come to Ephesus with Paul. I think they uh, took, went with Apollos when he decided to go back and minister to the Corinthians. I think they went with him to introduce him and then came right back home to Ephesus. Um, and the church in Ephesus meets in Aquila and Priscilla's home. So Apollos' bad news is undoubtedly shared not only with Paul, but with all the believers in Ephesus. Paul, of course, immediately sits down to write a stern letter to the Corinthians. It, this is the letter we know as 1 Corinthians, even though it wasn't really his first letter. He's made two big points so far. The first thing he said was, when I brought the good news to you, you believed it because of the power of the Holy Spirit, not because of my great preaching. So don't claim to follow me or Apollos or whomever. You are all believers together as one in the spirit. So, you know, obviously the, the Corinthians have been split into factions. We saw that last week and they're fighting with each other. So his other main point, point number two, was we have God's own spirit within us. The spirit knows God. Therefore, we know God just as well as the Spirit does. We understand what the Spirit says because we think like Christ. We have the mind of Christ, Paul says. The good news makes sense to us. We are able to discern and weigh and make sound judgments. Okay, so far so good. Let's see what Paul says next. He says, when I was with you, I could not speak to you as spiritual people. Rather, um, you were worldly. So I had to speak to you like infants, giving you milk rather than solid food. And you're still not ready. You are still worldly. I can tell because of the jealousy and contention among you. When you say things like, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, you are being worldly. We are nothing, me and Apollos, only diaconous, deacons, servants, just doing our jobs. I planted, Apollos watered, but God, God is the one who made it grow. The ones who plant and water are just doing their job and will be given their wages. We are just working with God. It's about you. You are God's field, what God is building up. So I want you to listen carefully here. That, that when Paul says the ones who plant in water, people like him, are just doing their job, he's talking about we have gifts from the Holy Spirit to do whatever we do. If we're planting seeds, we get seeds. If we're hoeing the ground, we get a hoe, that kind of thing. And he says, we'll be given their wages. Listen to that. This is one of the keys to understanding Paul, is the understanding that what we do, we are paid for. So let's see what else he says. Paul says, I just laid the foundation as a master builder by the grace of God and someone else is building on it. But take care how you're building on that foundation. That foundation is Jesus Christ. You can build on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or you can build on it with wood, hay, or straw and daylight will reveal its true nature. Fire will test it, Paul says. 
If a person's work remains, they will receive wages. But if a person's work is completely consumed, they will forfeit their wage, even though they themselves will be saved. They'll just be like someone who has experienced a fire. So I want to point some things out here. The typical translation here is that the person whose work remains receives a reward. But the Greek word used here is the same word Paul used earlier when he said that the worker in the field will receive their due wages. Paul is talking about wages for work done. The works uh, we build on the foundation of Jesus Christ are our works as disciples, as co-laborers in the field with God. And the Holy Spirit is going to test and reveal the truth about our works. That's basically what that's all judgment is, is just showing the, shining the light on things to see what's actually true. And standing in that refining fire, if our works stand as gold, we will receive our wages as workers. It's not a heaven or hell sort of thing. If we do crappy work and all we have left to show for our lives as believers is a pile of ash, all that happens is that we forfeit our wage. We ourselves have intrinsic value. We ourselves are like gold. We survive the fire of the Holy Spirit and are healed by it, always. You can take that one to the bank. We survive the fire of the Holy Spirit and are healed by it. Even if everything we ever did in life was useless in the kingdom of God. That is a powerful concept. Paul is saying that we ourselves have intrinsic value apart from our works. And he goes on to expand on this. He says, don't you know that you yourselves are the temple of God? Now, notice that Paul does not use the Greek word for flesh or body here. He does not say your body is the temple of God. Um, there's another similar one uh, later, later on in Corinthians. But starting here, Paul switches from the personal singular to the plural. This you is the plural you. It means you all. It means you as the whole body of believers. You all are collectively the temple of God and God dwells among you. Paul says, if anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy them. Now alert here, this verse has been used by the Christian church for centuries to say that anyone who completes suicide is condemned to hell and is utter anathema to God. But that is not what this verse is saying at all. Paul made it clear in the previous sentence that the temple of God he's referring to here is the plural you. It's the whole body of believers. Suicide oh. is individual. It happens when someone is in unbearable pain and sees no way out. Jesus was always infinitely tender with people in pain. The conversation around suicide is a completely different conversation than what Paul is having here. So strike this verse from your clobber list, and let's get back to what Paul actually is talking about, which is an existential threat to the entire community of believers. If anyone destroys the temple of God, he says, the entire community of believers, God will destroy them. That's pretty strong language. Let's take a closer look at that word destroy. According to Strong's Concordance, as shown on BibleHub.com, this word can be translated as corrupt, spoil, destroy, and ruin. But I also like to look at the root of the words I'm researching. And in this case, HELP's word studies from the Discovery Bible alerts us that the root means 
to waste away or degenerate. <laughs> That's helpful. I'm thinking that a great word to capture the richness of this meaning might be rot or perhaps break down. That seems to capture the idea behind this word of causing something to decompose from within. And that makes sense in this context. God should dwell in our midst. Anything else we allow to live there will ultimately lead to death and not to life. But God's not going to give us up without a fight. Paul continues, for God's temple is holy. You are holy. You plural. God makes his home um, within the body of believers as he has done since the beginning and as he did in the Garden of Eden and as he did throughout the Hebrew Bible um, in the stories of the tabernacle and as he is doing here among the believers in Corinth. God's home is among his people. And where God's holiness dwells, there is life, not rot or decay. So now Paul brings this thought full circle to where he started. He says, so stop being puffed up and prideful about following certain men, be it Apollos or Peter or even me. In other words, he's saying, don't put us in the center. That leads to rot. That leads to death. It's about God, not us. Paul continues, don't deceive yourselves. If anyone thinks they are wise, as this world would define it, then let him become a moron so he can become truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is dim-wittedness to God. It is written in Job 5, 12 through 13, he frustrates the plots of the shrewd so they cannot complete them. He captures the so-called wise in their own shrewdness. So here, Paul is saying that the wise of this world plot in vain. God causes them to fall into traps of their own making, which is sweet justice. <laughs> then Paul quotes Psalm 94, 11, which says, Yahweh knows the thoughts of man are ephemeral, a breath, a vapor. Paul says, so stop boasting about following certain people. Everything is yours. All things are yours, meaning, obviously, yours collectively as the body of Christ. Life, death, things present, things to come, even Apollos, Peter, and me, all are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. So think of, you know, just think of us as servants or stewards caring for the mysteries of God. And as stewards, we are required to be faithful. I don't care whether I am set apart and examined by you or even by a human court. I don't care what I think of myself. It is the Lord who separates me out and examines me. He will bring what is hidden to light and from him will come the praise. Brothers and sisters, I've used myself and Apollos as an example so you can learn that no one is any better than anyone else. You don't need anything other than what you already have. You have already been satiated. You are already wealthy. Even without us, you are as kings. I actually wish you were kings so we could reign with you. For it seems like us apostles are always last and least, chained up like prisoners on death row, trudging at the end of the procession. We are morons for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. Now, at this point, Paul is coming across a little snarky, but I don't think he means it that way. It's This is like the email problem where tone makes all the difference. I think he's, I think he's really trying to 
I think he's genuinely trying to say that being a great apostle is not the glory filled life of a celebrity that the Corinthians seem to think he, it is. He's trying to tell them they've got everything he does, but without the heart, hardship and heartache. He says, we are weak while you are strong. You are honored while we are not. Even now, we go hungry and thirst. We are ragged, mistreated, and homeless. We're exhausted from working to support ourselves. We're the scum of the earth, the filth that is scraped off. And yet, we give blessing in response to curses, comfort in return for slander. Through all this persecution, we endure. I'm not writing this to shame you, but as a father admonishing beloved children. You have many guardians, but not many fathers, for I begot you by bringing you the good news in Christ Jesus. So I urge you to imitate me. This is why I've sent my, quote, son, Timothy, to you. He will remind you of how I do things everywhere and of the things I teach in every church. Some of you have become arrogant since I haven't been there lately. And I'm about to come over there, Lord willing, and then we'll see if these folks are all talk or not. The kingdom of God is not about talk. It's about power. So take your pick. Shall I come to you with a rod or with a spirit of gentleness. <laughs> Yikes. I know which one I'd pick. Paul has hit this topic of attaching oneself to the coattails of a particular leader awfully hard. He's literally spent four chapters on it. This is a big, big deal. God has to be at the center of the church. It has to be. And what the Corinthians are doing is causing division in the church. And it is setting these leaders, these men up as idols. It will rot the church from the inside out. In blindly following these leaders and pitting themselves one against the other, the believers are forgetting their own identity in Christ. They are putting the Holy Spirit into mothballs. They're following men rather than checking with the plumb line of the Holy Spirit in their own hearts. Have confidence in that Holy Spirit within you. Paul is right. This is a very big deal. But enough said on that topic. Paul is ready to change topics. Paul is ready to address another elephant in the room. It's the reason he sent an earlier letter to them. What is it? Pornea, sexual immorality. Apparently, it's still a real problem in the Corinthian church. And I want to give you a trigger warning here that Paul's recommended action will be rejection of the person responsible. Hang in there if you can. I think our work on this um, will lead us to a place of um, health and understanding and, you know, knowing what to do with this and understanding when this is, why this might be good or bad, you know, obviously it's yielded bad fruit. Um, but if this whole topic is too tender for you, then feel free to leave the class at this point. We're going to read what Paul says, and we are then going to discuss it in our breakout groups. This teaching has been used to do a lot of serious damage in the church, and I think we need to examine it here in a safe place. So here we go. Paul says, so I hear that you have among you pornea, sexual immorality, that isn't found even among unbelievers. There is one among you who is helping himself to his father's wife. And you think that's something to be proud of rather than being sorry about it so you could remove that person from your midst. I'm not even there, but even I can pass judgment on the one doing this. So when 
you are gathered next time in the name of our Lord Jesus. And I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus. Hand over such a one to Satan, the adversary, the accuser, for destruction of the flesh, so that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, Paul is talking about handing this person over, but he says that he's not handing them over to God for destruction. Um, it's not God. And, and the Greek here also does not mean annihilation. So he's he's not handing this person to Satan to be annihilated, which is what we would associate with Satan. This word in the Greek means a sort of undoing. He's um, And we're, we're going to talk about all that in our breakout groups. But let's go on to see what, what else he says. He says, your boasting about this is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the entire dough? Clean out the old yeast so you will be a new unleavened dough. The Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed so we can take part in the feast. Not with the leaven of wickedness, but with unleavened clarity and truth. I told you in my last letter not to mix with, meaning closely associate with, the sexually immoral. And I'm not talking about the people of this world, otherwise you'd have to withdraw from the world. I'm talking about believers. Do not associate with believers if they are Hornas, sexually immoral, greedy, serve idols, are verbally abusive, are alcoholic, or a swindler. Don't even eat with them. Well, we're going to stop here a little, just a few minutes early today because the next set of passages will require more time than we've got today. We're about to hit another clobber passage. But to me, this last chapter in Paul's letter is a clobber passage all by itself. It has borne so much bad fruit, believers crushed and shunned in horrible ways. It has torn families apart. We, therefore, need to figure out where we've gone wrong in understanding what Paul is saying. I'm going to give you um, five extra minutes in your breakout uh, sessions today uh, because I had extra questions and I don't want Julia to be unhappy with me. So um, we um, will go talk about this, give each other grace, and um, I will see you back here in uh, probably uh, about 20 minutes instead of 15. Here we go. Gail, we didn't even have time with the extra time. <laughs> <laughs> That's because it was two pages long. I know, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot. That was a lot. No, I think I think the fact that, that this really struck a chord with all of us um, talks about how badly this has been misused against people as a weapon rather than as a um, device to strengthen. Yes. Talk to me more about that. That's because, because that's where Paul has got to be going. He's trying to strengthen the, the Corinthians, not destroy right. people. I get, my comment was that it, it, it becomes a slippery slope when we start, you know, getting rid of the bad fruit, because that's our judgment to begin with. And so it's a pretty slippery slope. And very quickly, I shared with my group that a pastor that I had no pastor, and this isn't to me, but it's the group, he became an alcoholic and his family was very enmeshed in our group and the church voted to just get rid of him. And I was a kid at the time, but I was pretty devastated and thought that was terrible. Why didn't they get him help first? Mm -hmm. The next church, the pastor got caught in the hot tub with one of his drinking buddies kissing the teenage girls. Aww. And the people who were parents of that and his drinking buddies defended that because then they'd have to look at themselves. Right. And it ended up 
splitting the church in half, no more church. So I think that there is a wide dichotomy here. Those are two great examples, kind of on one end and the other, right? But that's kind of, I was hoping they were. We, mm -hmm. we kind of focused on supporting the individual and being alongside them and walking with them and not really as much judging them, but also working within the confines of society's boundaries. Okay, meaning what? Talk to me a little bit about that. I'm going to hope Stevens pipes up. <laughs> Well, you were talking about with the societal boundaries. I think we were talking about with children, uh, things that are just too far, quote unquote, from society as well, right? I know that was one. Well, you know, if I'm understanding the passage that was being discussed during the lesson, this particular behavior that he's addressing in this church is so out of bounds that what he's saying is even the people outside of the church, even the Romans and the Greeks and the Corinthians think this is not good, that this is even outside of their moral standards. And you people are bragging about the fact that you've got this guy in your church. Mm -hmm. Oh, Shirley, you said something about the guy having uh, like a higher position in the yeah, church the or, impression. or a donor, you know, somebody that's giving the church a lot, a lot of money, money, maybe. You may have money, maybe. And so that's why they're bragging about him. Hmm. Because you would think that if he's doing it, there is somebody who's doing all these bad, I mean, these super bad things. I mean, it, it's not like they're just having a drink once in a while, you know, they've gone too far to the, other, to the bad, you know, like, and so why are they bragging about somebody like that? You know, well, that, that, I think that's a brag. great question. And what occurred to me is that they may be boasting about how progressive and flexible they are. Yeah, that's one of the things we said, too. Like, look, we accept anybody. Yeah. You know, look at us. We're, you know, we're so holy we can handle this or whatever. That's what's in this month. <laughs> you know, and, and I think we talked some about when that happens, like the question about should a boundary be tried first before expulsion? Uh huh. And I think Donna used an excellent word, like an intervention, because mm -hmm. we were talking about alcohol and serving alcohol to recovering alcoholics maybe that person the recovering alcoholics have individual choices to make but we can be there to support them so that they're not alone in making those decisions and but in the case of like child abuse you know if there's an outcry obviously you have to re protect the victim and potential other victims and so but you and that's a tough one society has rules and laws to deal with those things and you're getting into a church and state kind of issue there but you still don't want because we all have sins we all have failures you don't want to completely expel someone so that they're so alone that they may harm themselves or lose sight of the the ability to find joy in God and reel it in. That's so a good slippery slope. I, 
it's a slippery slope, but I also think that something that has always spoke to me about some of the the, the shunning and and yeah stuff is that I believe that before it gets to the extreme, like you said with child abuse or something like that, I would just drop a dime to the cops. I mean, that's breaking the law. Mm -hmm. I'm not a pastor, so. Uh, but I don't think the people should be able to protect somebody. I mean, they, I mean, back up, not protect, should shun somebody just because they think what's going on is wrong. Because How are they ever going to get help? It's like, why do we have prison ministries? The people in prison have done the most egregious things. Yet. <laughs> We don't forget that they're people and we still have a prison ministry to support them in trying to find a better walk and to right themselves with Christ. They have done the most egregious things, but there is a future still that needs to be navigated and i think that's about caring for one another one one of the things that that we were hoping to get more clarity in the in the after small group discussion was what is meant by shunning mm -hmm. um does that mean just removing them from being able to cause harm in the community either you know, by taking them out of leadership or or um, really truly kicking them out of the community, and what do, or does it mean to even if you see them on the street, you turn your back and you walk away, you completely mm -hmm. shun them. You know, they become a pariah to anyone in the community. And what exactly does Paul mean when he's telling them to shun this guy, to remove him? So I want to, as we discuss this, mm -hmm. I want to point out that any and all of these interpretations could be read into what Paul is saying. Mm -hmm. All right. So given that broad framework, let's see if we can hone in on what the wise course of action might be. And the and I want you to keep in mind that the wise course of action won't necessarily be the same in every situation. Yeah. That's that was my example of the two because my first pastor, I think he should have been helped and his family was part of us. That should have been tendered. The second pastor, as much as I'm all about helping people, he needs to not be in that community anymore. Mm -hmm. He cannot be with the young girls who know and their families or whatever. But that doesn't mean that we don't try an outreach so that he's not alone. Mm -hmm. You know, Martha brought something to our grave when we talked about, you know, the, the Galatians 5, 20 through 22, that the verses 19 through 21 are all things that tend to come from a selfish place. And then, but the spirit, the fruit of the spirit is, and the litany goes on. Those promote relationship over desire. That promotes community and relationship over personal desire. And I think when we keep that in mind, while we talk about this, that's helpful. Marlene, is that what you were saying that I disagreed with? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I think now that true. I heard it from that perspective, yeah, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, they start off with the acts of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. Those are not the same. That's not apples to apples. Talk more about that. Well, I, I suppose that it could be an apple if you have somebody whose fruit of the spirit is all those positive things. But I 
personally, I would really struggle with somebody who told me that they have never been in one of the, you know, mm -hmm. the impure, that, 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 all right. That, that, that they weren't one of those things. What's the difference? What is the difference? What are those, what is the purpose of those two lists? I just You're thought of something. Okay. The purpose of the two lists is you want to cultivate the fruits of the spirit. You want to control the other list mm -hmm. as a as a person. You need to control that where you want to say, no, I'm not going to do these things. I'm going to watch this because this is something I might have a problem with. So you got to watch those and the fruits of the spirit, you have to let it grow. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, probably those fruits of the spirit will shove out the stuff you have to constantly watch. Well, okay. and, and and one of the things that that pops out at me is the end of 21 is used as a weapon mm -hmm. often. Um, Can you read that? Live like this, we'll not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, so often I have heard that interpreted as these people are going to go to hell. They're not going to go mm -hmm. to heaven. And um, as we've been talking, it seems like throughout this whole class, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about this is what it's going to look like. And if you take that understanding of Jesus's picture of the kingdom, which can be here and now, mm -hmm. um, then that phrase means to me more people who are so busy engaging in all of these self-destructive states of mind and behaviors and, and activities will not experience what Jesus has envisioned for us to have here in the kingdom of God here and now. Right. Remember that, that these are, these show up in families mm -hmm. where you find one, you often find multiples. So you, 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 nobody is all one or all the other. You can be a good person and, and, you know, be an alcoholic, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. And we know a lot more about alcoholism now than they did back then. Right. So, so, um, the, this is just a broad brush impressionist picture of evil, good, <laughs> okay? Not to be parsed out in every little detail there. It's it's what culturally they would understand as bad versus what they would understand as good. I think it's, it's um, interesting that much of this has stood the test of time. So, you know, we, we understand, we read these two lists. We know which one is bad and which one is good. Right. And we got two hands up, Steven, you're first. Um, yeah, well, uh, two points, one's short. I think that in the case of the story that Paul is referring to, since we don't have the first letter that initially addressed this, I think it's hard to come up with what we're supposed to do <laughs> you know uh not that that's a bad thing i mean i think we are meant to search through that but boy it really would have been great if we had that other letter <laughs> <laughs> it would, and, it would. <laughs> and then another thing too is um looking at question two um, how do you tell the difference between something that is a threat to the group of believers and is not just something that is a sin with personal consequences that the person is wrestling with? Um, looking at the the list of acts of the flesh, fruits of the spirit, right? Um, and taking into context of the situation that Paul's talking about, that individual was boastful, prideful in their 
sexual immorality. Okay. But it, so in my mind, that person is not someone that we can come alongside because they feel like they have the right to do this thing. They don't see what's wrong with this. Right. Or at least they say where, they don't see what's wrong with this. Right. Uh, where someone that says, look, I, I struggle with hatred. I struggle with jealousy. Mm -hmm. I struggle with fits of rage. We can come alongside that person. Because they are, in my mind, they are actually living out the fruits of the Spirit and acknowledging that they struggle with those things. Now, do, do, is their life necessarily it? in a place of love or joy or peace and forbearance and all of this, it may not be, but they're trying because they're acknowledging. And I think that's the biggest thing is not it, recognizing that the individual is trying and then going to them with grace mm -hmm. Because it, it, it's something that I heard this morning on the podcast that, that I listened to said that what is grace? Grace is what we give or what God gives without any action being taken. Okay, so that person that may be struggling with something. What kind of grace are we affording them mm -hmm. to right. come alongside them? All right. Martha, you're next. Uh, we can't hear you. Stephen got real close to what I want to amplify a little bit. And that is the beginning of these two sections, the acts of the flesh, the things that are done, the actions. And I, the contrast is with the beginning of next, but the fruit of the spirit, which is a result, fruit is a result. Mm. And mm. Um, I just, um, I keep, being struck by that as we're reflecting on this today. Yeah. And so when Stephen mentioned that a difference can be the one who says, this is who I am and what I do, like it or not, versus I don't like these things about myself. I want them to be different. That is allowing the spirit to do its work and to bear fruit. I was just struck by the 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 prefix to each of these is different in a way that seems meaningful to me. That's very interesting observation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, 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 even look at Paul, uh, Paul saying, you know, that that I don't want to do, I do, and that that I want to do i don't do you know but yet the fruit that is produced by paul you know it, it, paul saying i'm not perfect but i'm trying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think it comes down to our motivation a lot of times it does but there's also um or is there I'm looking at this from the point of view of a pastor. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and so I think that that we tend generally to look at this as from the point of view of, of individuals in the church and what would we do and what could we do in this situation. And certainly I agree with um, everything you're saying, all of you, Julia's 
point about prison ministry and you know whatever that 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 you don't want to cut a person off that's that that is a form of abuse in its own way um it it just is um cutting them off from humanity and i can also see steven's point about you know sometimes people just don't don't think they're a problem so they're fine you know you go your way i'll go go mine kind of thing um and and um I think where Paul is, I think Paul is looking at this as a pastor with a responsibility for the health of the church. And I think that um, he sees from the way the Corinthians are reacting to this man that they are confused about whether this kind of behavior is egregious or not. Um, and so I think that he's he's going back into these like kind of vice virtue lists. He only did a little t snippet of one in this particular passage. But what's in view is these vice virtue lists. He's saying, wait a minute, guys, there is such a thing as good and not good. <laughs> um, and collect and you see these things collectively. So my question is. I know that in your family, as if you are a parent or whatever, responsible for your home, whatever you are, that if you had someone in your home who disagreed with you and you had, you were arguing about something, you're going to make every effort to work that out, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the relationship, the relationship is important and you're probably not going to toss them out on the street. All right. And never speak to them again. But if they come in your home and they bash holes in the wall and they hit people and they're doing damage, you would not tolerate that in your home because you would be protecting the people and the home, the integrity of this space. This, I think, is what Paul is trying to point out. I think Paul perceives this man as doing physical, spiritual violence to the, people. the body of the believers. <laughs> so the question is, when that, that was kind of the last set of questions was, once you go through this logic that you all have gone through, there are still going to be people who sift out the bottom as they are causing damage. Okay. It's not about whether we want a relationship with them. It's about what do we do about the damage they're causing in our community? And so my question is, what do we do? Yeah. I, you know, this is one of those things where human interpretation can be so incredibly subjective, this passage in particular. Um, because, you know, Paul is addressing a real, truly, I think we all can recognize this was a destructive behavior. This was way outside the norm. And, um, and, and it was causing confusion to the rest of the believers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and it was, it was extremely um, damaging to the community. The problem comes, I think, that many times this passage is interpreted as giving church leaders or a community permission to ostracize someone for multiple reasons. Um, you know, I've heard stories of people, yes, that I thought really truly should have been removed from a congregation, someone who was scamming members of the congregation, specifically targeting members of the congregation, and they trusted him because he was a member of the family. 
and he was bilking people out of thousands of dollars. Yes, he needed to be removed. But someone, you know, take as an example, um, a kid who comes out as gay um, and is just trying to live his life and is trying to follow God. But the church believes that this is wrong and could, you know, pollute the rest of the youth group. <laughs> <laughs> and they kick that kid out of the church and the family, if the family is supporting the kid. Um, I see that as harmful, although maybe in the long run better for the family to get out of that environment. But um, the, the, the way it's interpreted can be healthy for a, a community and maybe even help the offender to prepare their ways or can be really harmful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you hit a key there, um, Marlene, in that probably I think the error occurred in, in the case with of the kicking out the child um, in the community probably occurred way far back down the line in terms of how thing scripture got interpreted and how beliefs were built. And um, that kicking that child out and, and their family out was just a fruit of that particular stream of belief. That particular stream of belief was seen as so core to that community that having that child and their family in the community was perceived as a threat and an existential threat to the community. I would suggest that at that point, the community did the right thing for their community. It was a terribly painful thing. But as you point out, that child and their family probably didn't need to be in that community anymore. That there was going to be nothing but further more submerged rejection if they more if pain. they stayed more mm -hmm. pain it just never was going to the relationship was just never going to be there that that needed to be there um so as as painful as it is that community given what they believe probably did what was right for their community now i might have a big issue with what they believe all right and I might hope that the rest of the church might be there with open arms to welcome that child and their family, because I think Christianity is big enough for all of, for both. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that churches and believe, believing communities misstep just like people do. Mm -hmm. so Martha, do you have your, Martha has her hand up. I'm going to let her go. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to get those ones up. <laughs> Just recalling that um, and we've touched on it a little bit, but the first, but what happens when someone is shunned? Are they, are they to never come back? Are they to never have relationship? Are they to be cared for in some way until it's time to come back? When Cain left the garden, God said, you can't be here anymore. I will protect you. Thank you. <laughs> and that is so, that's God's example of how to do this, right? My question is who gets to decide? Because we're human in judgment as well. And we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Renee? Uh, can't both sides be a slippery slope? The person that they're saying, oh, you're doing something bad, is, you know, it's 
can be a slippery slope. But the people that are in the church that are judging the people that are doing something bad can also end up on a slippery slope. Yeah. So I think I think the problem sometimes is that people they have this list and this list is okay, you can't do any of this stuff. And if you put one little toe on any of this stuff, you're out are just as bad as the person that is doing something horrendous and bragging about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of my point about who gets to decide, right? Yeah, I mean. It, hmm. it boils down to the groups, all right? What it boils down to is what Paul was talking about in this lesson, is when you're in a group, Look to see what is in the center of it. Is it God and is it life giving? Or is it a set of rules or an individual or whatever that is dealing death in the way the fruit works out? It's, I think that Paul has begun to address the body as a corpus. So we have collectively in our groups of believers, we have identity. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to what's at its center. Because the I think the answer is, it is a slippery slope. It is, and but the criteria you're using is based on what's in the center. Okay. And so I would enter in as a pastor, if I was feeling like somebody needed to be excluded from the church because they were doing serious damage, I would take my shoes off and enter with fear and trembling. I would not go alone. I would have gone to this person already individually and talked it out. If I can't make them understand why this behavior is a problem, I would go to someone else, senior in the wise, whatever word you want to use in the group have a conversation with them and say, am, am I seeing this wrong? Am, is it me? Is it, am I misinterpreting this? Is there another way to handle this? Because I know my shortcomings and my temper and all the things, right? And I know I have baggage and I know I get triggered. Well, I need to go talk to somebody and say, there's a situation, what do you think? Okay. And then go together if if they determine that, yeah, I think you're seeing this clearly, go together and talk to them, to that, to the person. If we can't, and then if we can't communicate, if this is making no sense, if this person still feels like this is something they want to continue to do and they have a right to continue to do this, it gets escalated up through a broader and but not up hierarchically as much as outwards in the group, right? And more people, so that in the end, it is the group um, that recognizes that this is not ever gonna work and this is damaging behavior. Now, does that get, done very quickly in the case of child abuse yes it does that's a one and done thing <laughs> okay embezzlement one and done where you know you move to a different paradigm right does that mean i have no there is no place for the church in coming alongside someone who str struggles as a pedophile of course not or who struggles 
with thinking other people's money is theirs? <laughs> of course not. We we can be there for them. I think Paul didn't think the Corinthians could be there for this guy because they could not distinguish right from wrong as mature in maturity. He started the whole thing out saying you're acting like babies in the first place. And that's where we can draw in our collective wisdom and experience to do things together. It no, no decision is going to be perfect. But we don't have to destroy people in order to protect, in order to keep them from destroying us. Does that make sense? Even though a lot of organizations do try to destroy the person. Yes, they do, and are vindictive about it. Julia. Okay, this is probably a whole nother lesson, but <laughs> in these situations where someone needs to leave the church, how do we help that person find a church community where they will be welcomed? Do we now draw fish on the doorway when we're going somewhere? It just seems like there's so many religions that have such strict rules about things that are nonsensical to me in some ways. And yet people are expelled, but they need a place and It's those situations. How do you continue to be there for them so they're not alone? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, I, I think you've asked two different questions, Julia. It sounded like he started by saying, if we have somebody in our community that we feel is being damaging by who they are, what they're doing, and we need to remove them from our community, how do we help them find another community? And to me, that's like, well, that's, you know, putting, you know, a little rotten apple in somebody else's barrel. Mm -hmm. um, but if what you're saying is, if we know of someone who has been expelled by community and that community is not still trying to walk alongside them to help them or what they think is helping is damaging, then what is our responsibility as someone outside of that community to to show some love and see if there is some way that we can come alongside them? I, I'm trying to understand which of those two questions. The latter, the latter. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm looking at it from, there's so many places where the rules are so rigid that to me, it's nonsensical why this person's being removed from a community their heart is with god they're struggling with something or they may not even they may have accepted something that the church doesn't value so to speak and but this is where, someone. and this is where we need to have our eyes and ears open for the people that God brings into our lives and across our path. That's where the whole rest of the body needs to be aware. And there are resources. We can bring resources. Um, there are resources for people who are looking for churches. Um, there's one called Church Clarity. Uh, there's another one. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, another one similar like that. Another um uh, website where you can look for churches and understand who they are before you go. You can also gaychurch.org. Pardon? That's it. Gaychurch.org. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's another one. If it, if the issue was LGBTQ, that's not always the issue. Um, so anyway, food for thought. 
I know this has touched many of us personally. We will actually talk about this some more in our breakout groups next week, just coming at it from a different way. Um, so I appreciate you hanging in there. Any last comments before we go? I think just to answer Julia's question, that's why we have organizations like Suicide Hotlines and the Trevor Project and Free Mom Hugs and Free Hearts. I don't know. There's lots of different societies out there. Um, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous. That's mm -hmm. why we have all those things. So that when somebody may be rejected by their community, they can find another community that can help them. Yeah. Okie dokie. I'll see y'all next week. Thanks for hanging in on a tough topic. Yeah. Bye, y'all. <laughs>